Hello and good evening. I'm Larry Wessels, co-host on this show, Pilgrim Publications Presents. And I want to welcome you here to this special program today. We're, we're talking about a uh, topic that we've been talking about now for quite a while. It uh, concerns a big debate we had with uh, a local minister here in Austin, Texas, where this is being taped, uh, concerning the Church of Christ and its doctrines of baptism. And before I go more into this topic, I want to introduce now my co-host, Bob L. Ross. Bob, want to say hello to the viewers out there? Well, Oops. Hi, Larry. I've already gotten off on the wrong leg here. Uh, we're glad to uh, come back again and uh, talk about the differences between what we believe to be the teaching of the Bible and what we hear so often from those who claim that they're the Church of Christ and as a matter of fact the one and only Church of Christ. So I'm glad to be able to come back again and participate in this. And uh, I'd like to say right now to our viewing audience, uh, I'll go ahead and put these up just to let it be known. I think uh, my co-host here, Mr. Bob L. Ross, is an expert on this subject. He's written three books on it, as a matter of fact. As uh, maybe our camera can pick up here, we've got Campbellism is History and Heresies by Bob L. Ross, Acts 238 and Baptismal Regeneration, and also the Restoration Movement, which is where basically the Churches of Christ uh, originated from, from this Restoration Movement. Right. Uh, you've also got, <laughs> I would almost say, literally hundreds of tracks similar to this one. This one's called Restoration Principles, Shocking Facts. Yeah, we prepared maybe at least a dozen or more just for the Jackson debate, and then we had some available prior to that. For instance, what is the name of the church? We've had that one available for years. Right. And, and historical information on uh, Campbellism, we've had that one in print for years. And by the way, that's a, that's a collection of quotations out of all the various secular and religious encyclopedias that uh, give responsible information concerning the history of various groups. Mm -hmm. And it's just quoting that without comment in that booklet, Historical Information. I've got you. And Britannica, Americana, all the uh, well-known encyclopedias, plus the religious mm -hmm. encyclopedias that are published. Now, all these materials like this, and uh, I'll take this moment to mention this one also, uh, we, you have a videotape here available called The Church of Christ Denomination, True Church or Cult. And uh, this features you and Dr. Robert A. Morey and, and, uh, uh, and Pastor Bullock. We will also have the video of this debate with Jackson. It yes. will be available. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, viewers that are watching the show can tune in, or if they stay tuned, at the end of the program we'll have your mailing address right. in Pasadena, Texas, and a phone number where you can call to get more information on these topics. But I thought I'd uh, mention this and show this, that uh, you are indeed well qualified to speak on this topic. So I'll take these down, and we'll get into the subject at hand. And you've already made reference to it, uh, talking about Jackson. And what this all comes around to, in case you haven't uh, tuned into our earlier broadcasts now, which have been running for many weeks, uh, my co-host here, Bob L. Ross, was involved in a week-long debate. <laughs> Seemed like a never-ending debate. And in fact, it, it was going on, on, going on for quite a while before the debate actually took place, uh, back and forth on different television shows and correspondence flying back and forth and, and, and all this. There, there's, al there's always some sort of peripheral material uh, <laughs> one, in one form or another that accompanies the debate, generally. Uh -huh. And uh, so what happened was uh, Bob met uh, the minister of the Southwest Church of Christ named Bill Jackson in a week-long debate, basically a, a four-night debate, on a Monday night, a Tuesday night, a uh, Thursday night, and a Friday night. That was January uh, 21st, 21st, 22nd, 24th, uh, 4th and, 5th. and 5th, 1991. And uh, what this program, this series that uh, we're holding here, uh, covers that debate. We're showing clips from the debate 
no edits. Actually, it's the the entire debate. Nothing's been left out or chopped out. Except well, you know, it was predicted that this would not run unedited, so I'm glad you're putting that in. That yes, although we're we're filling up the latter part of the hour in our TV program, mm -hmm. we're just filling up the space. We're not editing the debate in any way. Right. All of debate footage is being shown as it was filmed right. in this series. But of course, obviously, we've got like 10 and a half to 11 and a half hours of debate footage. And who in their right mind is going to sit there for 10 and a half or 11 hours watching a debate, no matter how fervent you are, <laughs> wanting to see the information. So we felt the only way it could really be shown and be presented in a reasonable way where we have a lot of background information in this kind of format is to put it in a series form so that viewers can tune in each week and get the unedited parts of the debate week after week until they've finally seen it all. But again, we can emphasize for those who do have the patience and the mentality to sit through a consecutive watching of it, we will have the unedited tapes available for those yes. that want that. Yes, uh, one thing I did notice, and it's coming up in one of our, our later shows that you'll see that uh, Bill Jackson, uh, your opponent in this debate, had uh, said that he was going to air this whole debate unedited on Ast uh, Austin Cablevision, for everyone, and he was going to send out letters, I think, to every Baptist church so they could tune in, you know, but so as far as I know, I haven't heard anything about it now, and uh, we're, well, we're taping this show pretty far into the, the year already. Yeah, we're, we're, we are. Uh, it could have run before this show airs, but nevertheless, at this point in time, which has been, what, five months? Five or six Four months or five now, months. something like that. And uh, I haven't heard of anyone receiving letters, and I certainly haven't mm -hmm. caught it on television. Uh, something like that, running for that many hours, <laughs> it seemed like somebody would have talked about it or, or said something about it, so I don't know yet if, uh, if they're even really going to show it. But at least through our format, you'll be able to see the whole debate. And uh, like you just mentioned, get copies of it. Well, I, you know, I've, my experience has been with debating Church of Christ. They're not always as pleased or satisfied with the debate afterwards as they think they're going to be beforehand, and I hope that's the case with this one. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Well, uh, let's uh, begin our program today. And just kind of, for a lot of our normal viewers are familiar with some of this material, but I'll just bring it up real quick and we'll move right into uh, tonight's debate footage, which you'll see. Uh, but going to my chart, we'll just uh, briefly bring you up as to what's, what's happening here. Uh, of course, in the debate, there was propositions signed uh, by both, uh, both gentlemen. And of course, uh, if the camera can zoom in on some of this so our viewers at home can maybe read this, we'll come to the, the top two propositions here. This is what I want to center in on. We'll start on Proposition 1. That's not what we're talking about in this particular debate footage, but just to bring you into Proposition 2. What we see here is propositions for debate. Affirmative uh, propositions proposed by Mr. Bill Jackson. That's your opponent. And he's going to affirm this proposition. Number one, the scriptures teach that the church of which I am a member, known as the Church of Christ, is scriptural in origin, organization, name, worship, and doctrine. And that's for Monday night. Uh, which our regular viewers have already seen that debate footage. And he affirms it, and you are in the, the denial of that on this proposition, that uh, his church, the Church of Christ, was scriptural in all these things. Of course, now on uh, Proposition 2 here, which is what we're coming into tonight, uh, our viewers today are going to see uh, the second speeches that centered around this proposition that Bill Jackson was affirming. And he's saying, the scriptures teach that baptism is into Christ and is for unto the remission of past and alien sins and that such baptism is required for salvation. Of course, there's a signature affirming and, of course, my co-host here in the denial for Tuesday night. Larry, it's not of a great consequence of anything, but let me say this about these propositions. Both these propositions were written by Bill Jackson and I signed them to deny them without any uh, expression of disapproval or asking for a change or anything of that kind. Mm -hmm. But contrary to my doing that, when I wrote the propositions which I would affirm, I had to change them 
to satisfy Bill Jackson. And uh, I have found this to be kind of a consistent practice with the Churches of Christ. Uh, they won't let you state it in the language and in the manner that you want to state it. Uh, they want to debate about the way you've written your proposition. So my practice is I give them one change and that's it. And then if they want to debate that, then they can just get them another pigeon. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, as it was expected, he requested that I change the wording of my propositions. So mm -hmm. I altered them to satisfy him the one time, and that was it. I wouldn't change them anymore. But I signed his just as he uh, submitted them to me. Right, because if you're going to debate, you should be able to debate on what you want to affirm. Right, and, and if I can deny it, I'll sign it. And if I can't mm -hmm. deny it, then I just won't sign it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And so here's what we're talking about here for our viewers, is this second proposition is what uh, Bob Ross and Bill Jackson will be debating about in the footage you're going to see shortly. Uh, moving on quickly here, just as a recap, this has been on several of our shows already, but for new viewers, I always like to show this chart. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. Uh, you'll hear mentioned in the debate footage several references to these men. And so I bring this up show after show just to let people know exactly who you talk about when and you mention a Campbell. And, or and a we stuff. should preface this by emphasizing, Larry, that this is not something that we have dreamed up or conjured up, but this is materials that we secured out of history books written and published by the Church of Christ. Exactly. These comes from their history books. Right. These pictures here, they came from Church of Christ books. All the claims that they make come from Church of Christ books. It's not something that we're asserting about them. It's mm -hmm. something they have asserted about themselves. Yes. And in preparation for this particular debate we're discussing, you, you had over 300 charts, and many of those are photostatic copies right, right. out of Church of Christ they're, they're always objecting to our use of history. Well, it so happens that every single item of history that I quoted uh, that I recall came out of the writings of the historical writings of the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why should they object to our quoting their own literature? Exactly. In history you can show a lot from history. Here's Bill Jackson's magazine. These men are the restorers. Look at the headline here. Restoration Peaks. That's front page. That's his magazine, and what's the date over there? Is that October? October 1989. And so, and this was one article in a series that he ran in his magazine teaching this restorationism and mentioning by name Thomas Campbell and Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone and men of this sort. And so we just get this material out of their own writings. That's right. And did, I think even Jackson had stated that he caused men to believe the truth or something of that nature. Yes, he said you could read the Millennial Harbinger and there are numerous letters of testimony in there about Campbell leading men mm -hmm. uh, to the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course uh, on that point you can also read uh, uh, everyone else in the cultic world. They have their <laughs> testimonies too of people that have been healed and miracles and all, all right. manner of things. Well, we better hurry along here, Bob, because... Yeah, let's, let's push it. Let's push it on. Let me just mention this chart then and go on. These men are restorers of the true Church of Christ. <laughs> how? Acts 2.38 and these other passages, Mark 16, 16, you know you know how it goes. As interpreted by these men. These men, who are they? The restorers. Focusing on baptism. Exactly. Alexander Campbell, the master spirit as they call him, right? Right. His son-in-law called him the Master Spirit. Uh -huh. And Walter Scott, restorer of the ancient gospel. And that's what he said of him. Uh huh. And these guys are some of the founders of the Church of Christ as we know it today. They don't like to use the word founders. They like to use the word restores. Mm -hmm. But, of course, as they want to emphasize about Bible terms, this is no more a Bible term than founder. Of Bible <laughs> exactly. <terms. laughs> and uh, of course, what are they saying? In the chart, it makes it clear what these men are saying and what the churches of Christ are saying. In order to obtain salvation, you must believe the Bible as these restorers have interpreted it for you. Obviously, we're talking about Acts 2.38 and its doctrine of baptism. And uh, if you don't believe this Acts 2.38 and these other passages, as these restorers have restored the, quote, ancient gospel, mm -hmm. then, of course, the consequences of that are, as we see, 
you go to hell. <laughs> That's pretty, Campbell, pretty obvious. Campbell claimed that he was the first man on this continent to teach Acts 238 to mean in order to obtain remission. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who followed in this movement, they just keep parroting off mm -hmm. his theory, and some of them don't even know where it came from. Well, let's, let's leave it at that right now and uh, go to our debate footage, let you see the second night of the debate, that's Tuesday night, as we already mentioned on a proposition. Bill Jackson will be in the affirmative, and Bob will be in the denial, and then we'll come back after that. So, enjoy. <laughs> I see that we finally shamed him into dealing with some of the questions, sort of. Now, just some of the questions. I hate we had to do that, but nevertheless, we did have that agreement. He mentioned that he didn't get to all the questions. He certainly did not to the one concerning Philip of the eunuch. He certainly did not concerning baptism as a work of righteousness. He certainly did not concerning the tract that was written regarding the mediator. He did touch on baptism of Christian duty and said that God commanded it once in a lifetime. I asked him concerning the plan of salvation, sort of a hedge on that, but he said anything that uh, conveys a cultic idea identifies a cultic system. On television, he had indeed romped on the plan of salvation and made fun of it. Let me read you a little statement in this book on page 276. He refers to some passages and says they practically are repetitious because there are so many of these verses in John and in the Bible that the Lord is, I think, obviously trying to show how simple and how clear the plan of salvation is. That was Mr. Bob L. Ross in his debate with Garland Elkins. Are you a cultic man? The very idea. On television, he romped and stomped about these expressions and plan of salvation. Where is it in the Bible? That's cultic language. That signifies a cult. And here is Bob L. Ross using that kind of language. Well, I didn't think he'd stay a Baptist very long. There's hardly anybody, it seems, that has fellowship with him among the general Baptists. Now he's representing a Reformed group. Sounds like restoration, doesn't it? There must have been something wrong with the other system. Therefore, they had to reform it. Now, you're using cultic language, Mr. Ross. Shame, shame, shame on you for that. Now, I have some other questions. Our agreement was, and I'm not going to ask any in my third speech because he'll have enough to do in making up. Now, I think I can set this one aside because it was a question having to do with the questions that I was asking him after he agreed to, ask, to answer questions, but the questions I submitted him, he wasn't answering. But I'll skip that one because it had to do with it. In the record of the jailer's conversion, Acts 16, and after he was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, when does the context show the Holy Spirit called the jailer a believer? Was Spurgeon speaking truth when he said, and I'm referring to this, though I don't think he's mentioned the term he has in other instances. Spurgeon said, I find the great era which we have to contend with throughout England, and it's growing more and more, is one in direct opposition to my text, well known to you as the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. We will confront this dogma with the assertion that baptism without faith saves no one. Now Spurgeon said baptism or regeneration was the doctrine that thus one is baptized without faith on his part. He's talking about baptizing the infants. Now that's from the booklet on baptismal regeneration by uh, Spurgeon, page 315, published by Pilgrim Publications, Mr. Ross's publication firm. Mr. Ross, are you in agreement with one of England's most prominent Baptist scholars, G.R. Beasley Murray, who says, the easiest way I can represent this among Baptists is that baptism is the completion of conversion. That in the New Testament, the two, baptism and conversion, are never separated. Once one realizes that baptism and conversion are inseparably kept together, then you can appreciate how it is that Paul can say, all who were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. 
Now that's from a man that Mr. Ross and myself have recognized as one of the outstanding scholars in writing on baptism that has one of the classic books on baptism. I suppose he's one of the ranking Baptist scholars in Britain and that's carried in Christian Standard an interview with him November the 11th, 1990, just a short while ago. Now, Mr. Ross, some of your own Baptists are deserting you. They're coming around to see the New Testament. I know you can't keep them in ignorance very long. Now, the next question. What is the explanation of the fact that 200 or so scholars produced 30 or more translations, and I'm going to show you that in a moment, and yet these did not render Acts 2.38 because your sins have already been forgiven or any such language? Please tell us exactly how two, Acts 2.38 should read to fully and completely convey the truth relating to baptism and the remission of sins. All right, would you hand these to Mr. Ross, please? Now we'll begin and notice some things. Put up his chart, B221. Hold my time if we're having to uh, find the chart. All right, now please notice our subject is baptism. He's already got me on the N.B. Hardeman, he got me on the Reader Oldham, and got me on the H.A. Dobbs. I'll tell you, the only thinking that can be done is around what men have had to say. It so happened I've never discussed with N.B. Hardeman and any of these other men this particular point. Notice I brought up what the scriptures had to say on those charts. He immediately runs to find out what some man had to say about it in order then to say that Bill Jackson thus is contradicting these men. And he said that I will pick out the cases of conversion and implied that I was ignoring some other things. Ladies and gentlemen, didn't I make the statement there are plenty of instances where the synecdoche is used and that Paul said that people believed on the Lord, people responded to the word of the Lord, that people made obedience to the Lord. I referred to that. And why does he get up here and imply that I was trying to hide something from you? I said that these cases of conversion, he doesn't like that language, cases, accounts, record, passages. How about passages? These passages on conversion, that these are the ones giving us details beyond just a single word, and that was the use that we made of them. He talked about the doctrine of patternism. I think he's already uh, indicated that he doesn't believe the pattern. I don't see how it could be an authoritative document if he doesn't believe there are any patterns therein. The question on the pattern, he said that this came up in the question and answer session. Now he's trying to inject it in our speeches. It came up in the question and answer session. Let's deal with it in the question and answer session. And those that were involved in it, remember that point that we can bring it up. Ross number P2. Hold my time if it's going to take a while to get the charts. All right, number P2. I'm going to put this up here because he immediately starts and gets into Campbell and the restoration movement. This is all the notice I'm going to take of it because Thursday night is when he is in the affirmative on the restoration movement. Now, he's on it every night. But it's Thursday night that we will be discussing the restoration movement. Why is he bringing this in tonight? In order to use up the time so that he'll have to say as little as possible about baptism. All right, please take that down. That's the proposition the next time. He says you can't have a church without baptism. Well, Mr. Ross, it is not my fault that the Holy Spirit said in Acts 2 and verse number 47 that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It is not my fault in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 that we're told that through one spirit or by one spirit we're all baptized into the one body. You need to take that up with the Apostle Paul. You need to take that up with the Holy Spirit. You need to take that up with the Apostle Peter. They're the ones that cause that to be stated there. He says universal church. Well, it so happens that I do believe that when Philip baptized the eunuch out in that uh, deserted area, there wasn't any congregation there. 
I believe the Lord added the eunuch to the church, but he didn't add him to a local congregation. That'll be up to the eunuch to decide that. He didn't add him to the church in Ethiopia. The eunuch could go back there and start one if one didn't exist already. I don't know what his point is unless he believes there's no such thing as a church throughout the world. I don't know of anybody that's baptized into a local congregation unless the Baptists do it. We baptize people into the church. They're baptized into Christ. Sometimes they're not even members of our local congregation and don't intend to be. They're not baptized in the Southwest. If they're going to place membership and work with us, well and good. If they're going to some of the other congregation, well and good also. Bill's view, he said. According to Bill's view, uh, the, the matter of baptism into the church. According to Bill's view. Now, where, what did you do with my charts that I put up there? That was not Bill's view. He said that we hold the conviction that you're never saved in this life. There's not a bit of truth in that. Baptism is for the remission of sins. If it's for the remission of sins, you're saved in this life. Now, he's edging toward the point that you're saved and whether or not you can lose your salvation. We may have to deal with that certainly on Friday night when uh, you can be saved, according to some Baptist anyway. We'll press him on it. You can be saved and then you can live like the very devil to your dying moment and you still go to heaven. He'll accept baptism. Does it literally wash you away sins? The Lord literally said it. Let's put it that way. The Lord literally said, Wash away sins, Acts 22 and 16. Now that's a tactic of theirs. Is it literal? Is it not literal? Is it literal? Is the sin literal? Is the blood of Jesus Christ literal? Is the statement literally so that the Lord said that baptism is for the remission of sins and to wash away sins? There's the point. I was glad to hear him on this. Baptist articles of faith bound him to the Bible. Do you hear that? Wasn't his faith in the Bible that bound him to the Bible? It wasn't his conviction concerning the Bible that bound him to the Bible. Is the Baptist articles of faith. I think he said number one, didn't he? Got to get them right, you know. Number one, bound him to the Bible. Well, I fear for any man that has to be bound to the Bible by some articles of faith that some other man brought up. Third degree on repentance. I didn't say a word about third degree on repentance. I was explaining they were baptized over to those who are repentant. And if I knew that a man was in some kind of sin and he indicated to me that he was not ceasing it, he would not be a proper candidate for baptism. Now, if you knew a couple was living in adultery, Mr. Ross, would you accept them into whatever religious group or church you happen to be with and they could just continue in that and go right on? Ross is number 27, and then 26. Hold my time. All right, Ross number 27. If we agreed on all of this, and then how about Campbell and, and Thomas, Alexander, and all of those? That's Thursday night's proposition. Take it down. Please give me number 26. I can look at those two men. That's Thursday night. Please take it down. Now, somebody give Mr. Ross a calendar and the propositions that we have. 1 Peter 4 and 11 I have a question, and I'll just ask it now. He says, where is this idea of speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where the Bible is silent? Well, or is Mr. Ross going to tell us that he uh, freely speaks where the Bible does not speak and then where the Bible is silent that Mr. Ross is going to insert? He says, don't use 1 Peter 4 and 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. What is the difference in the import? Was the apostle Peter commanding then that we be infallible men by that? Then Ross number two. Oh, my time. If we could get the charts and the projector a little closer together, uh, it would help. All right, number two. What he's not denying. Now he's back into the restoration movement. He's discussing in order to obtain Alexander Campbell down here. That's a Thursday night, Mr. Ross. We'll get to that. Now let's move on and notice, pick up with my affirmative, that we might then make some headway. We'll notice that matter of in order to obtain. Remember he questioned that, my J42. Here is something that was presented to Mr. Ross about 12 years ago. 
I'm going to make use of it now. Two of the greatest living grammarians in Greek happened to be Ray Summers and A.T. Robertson, both of them Baptist grammarians. Both of these men in Mark 16 and 16 point out that believeth and is baptized or aorist participles relating to the verb action shall be saved. Now notice what they say. This is from Summers, Essentials of New Testament Greek. They indicate the finished action by the subject in past time. What's the finished action? Salvation. Well, what was that in past time that resulted in their salvation? Belief and baptism. Now, again, the time of action is antecedent to the action of the main verb. Main verb, being saved. What was the, that which was antecedent or preceding that? Believeth and is baptized. Now, notice Mr. A.T. Robertson. The Greek never uses the heirs' participles for subsequent action. No example of that has ever been found or used. What's that word? Or, no example of that has ever been shown. Now, 12 years ago, Mr. Elkins gave that to Mr. Rawls, and all he could ever come up with, that Mr. Robertson one time, in looking at Acts 2 and 38, said that it is not for the remission of sins. Well, I know that sometimes a man who's a grammarian, he's not thinking about the doctrinal uh, implications. He's looking at the grammar, and he tells us what the truth is. Now, it's not my fault if Robertson can't be consistent when now as a Baptist he's going to speak to you concerning his doctrine. Now, J30, please. All right, here are 30 translations of Acts 2 and 38. I cannot read through all of them, but 30 of them, beginning with the King James and the American Standard. And notice that all of that for the remission of sins, unto the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, to remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, for the, with a view to the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, that your sins will be forgiven, that your sins will be forgiven, for the forgiveness of sins, in order to have your sins forgiven, good speed, for the pardon of your sins, so that your sins will be forgiven. Now, if he says, well, I don't see in order to obtain, well, now, what does that mean other than what these said? But still, my question was, how is it that 30 of these translations involving men who have translated, and many of them Baptist, and they put forth these translations, something like 200 men, 30 translations, and not a one of them come with this, up with this idea because your sins have already been forgiven? Now, Mr. Ross, you please deal with that. All right, number J16. He mentioned ice or he mentioned ace. Now, let me hurriedly mention this. He's trying to use for, the Greek would be ice or ace. I'll use ace. He's trying to say that it will mean because of the remission of sins. If he did not accept that, then it will certainly mean in whatever way he puts it, your sins are, have already been taken away. Notice there are about 11 to 1,200 times that that word is used, according to Bullinger's critical lexicon. Some 100 more times with various applications amounting to 1,200 different instances. Now, will not the context have to tell us? Wouldn't it be in the context, the context having to do with the subject, with what is being discussed, with other verses that, reply, that uh, affect the subject? Of course, that's the case. Number J17. Now, will he find refuge in the Greek? Let's look and see. Can he find refuge in the Greek? Now, oftentimes they'll try to do that. But notice Acts 2 and 38, for the remission of sins, and there's the Greek just under it. Matthew 26 and 28, the Lord said, This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. The exact Greek statement. Now, same wording in Greek, same wording in English. Question, was Christ's blood shed because our sins we're already forgiven. He can't find refuge in the Greek. Can't find it in English. Can't find it in Greek. J40. When I get to a minute, please keep holding it up, and then a half minute so that I'll make sure I see it. Regeneration and baptism. Titus 3 and 5, the subject of salvation, not by works of righteousness. God's mercy is that which saves us by the washing of regeneration by the washing of regeneration. 
not by works of righteousness. Therefore, baptism is not a work of righteousness in the sense that it is a condemned thing by the washing of regeneration. Where is there a washing in the entire process of one making a response to God? Our works of righteousness being condemned, but the washing being necessary, that isn't the washing essential to salvation. What in man's response to God can be called a washing? Now, they like to use the term baptismal regeneration. Raise it up and let's point it out. Baptismal regeneration, you want to use that language? Well, let's state the whole thing. Faith regeneration, repentance regeneration, confession regeneration, and if you want to add baptismal regeneration, well and good. The fact is that all of them are required in the process by which man comes to God. Now, number J41. Was the cleansing power in the water or in the obedience? Was that when God's action took place in the garden? Was damnation in the fruit or was it in the act of disobedience? Today, salvation not in the water. You have to be baptized. The Lord commanded it. The Lord described it as water baptism. Salvation in the water because that's where Christ is and that's where the blood is or salvation in the obedience. It's by one's obedience into Christ. All right, brother, uh, put up those charts. Now, I suppose that most of you have judgment enough to realize that some of the things he said here were actually designed to make me take positions that I don't take. In other words, I've never taken the position that ice in Acts 2.38 meant because of. I've never taken the position that he that believeth and is baptized in Mark 16, 16 had reference merely to present salvation. It has reference to final salvation. So his bringing up Robertson and Sumner simply confirms me in my position that it's referring to a future salvation that's compared to future condemnation. If you'll open your Bibles in Mark 16, 16 and compare it, he that believeth and is baptized uh, shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be what? Damned. Now, when are you damned? Now? No, you're damned in the future. It's the final damnation. Now, if you don't believe now, you're what? You're condemned, but you're not damned. See, the present state of the unbeliever is condemnation, not damnation. Now, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. When? Compare it to the latter part, it compares to the damned. I have a chart with Thomas Warren I'll put up here, hopefully before the night's over, where he shows the exact parallel that I'm teaching you here. But I want to get to this chart, brother, before we get any further. He brought up about me being bound by the Baptist confession. I'm bound by the first art, what the first article in the Baptist confession says, and it says that the Bible... It's what binds me, not the Baptist confession. Now, Bill, if you've got a Baptist confession, I dare you to bring it to the platform and read Article 1 and tell me that you don't believe it yourself and you don't agree with it. I dare him to bring the Baptist confession up here and read Article 1 and tell me he doesn't believe it because that first article just simply says, simply says that the Bible is our final authority and we're to accept it in all matters and faith. And that's what I meant by being bound. I didn't mean that what the man wrote down bound me. He knew better than that. Thomas Campbell wrote that statement that you're bound by. We speak where the Bible speaks. Are you bound by Thomas Campbell, Bill? You say you speak where the Bible speaks. Thomas Campbell wrote that. You had it in your Christian Worker magazine quoted several times. Are you bound by Thomas Campbell? He knows better than that. He's just trying to twist things around to appeal to the, I hate to say the word because I know you're not all this way, but really it's an appeal to ignorance. I believe you people know that, and I don't believe you're ignorant. I don't believe there's a single person here tonight that knows, that doesn't know better than what this man tried to say when he said, I'm bound by the human writing of that confession and rather than what's in the confession by way of content. There's not a person here tonight that doesn't know the difference. Now look at this. But I want to show you this. Their doctrine on elders says to rebel against God's elders, the leaders, is to rebel against God himself. Now, 
As long as those men are teaching the truth of God's Word, I know it's, in a sense, rebellion against God in the sense that it's God's Word. But let's drop back up here a little ways. Brother, can you move it up just a little? He says that elders have authority in matters of expediency. Now, who defines expediency? The man who wrote this, Mr. Thomas Warren, and he says the exercise of human judgment is binding. Now their doctrine on elders teaches that where the Bible does not explicitly state a doctrine or a law, the elders can make the decision and their human judgment constitutes binding authority equal to the Word of God. Human judgment to rebel against God's designated leaders in matters of the exercise of human judgment, which is binding its law, these men are just regular little popes, aren't they? Now let him bring up here the Bible that says elders are to have authority in what he calls expediency. You won't find that word in the Bible. That's one of his cultic terms, ladies and gentlemen. You find me elders and expediency in the same passage, Bill. Now, he brought up, what was it, 200... Translations that translate Acts 2, where's the rest of them? Where's the rest of them? You need to answer. I know you don't have them. But what I wanted to ask is this. How many of them said baptized in order to obtain which he teaches? Did he bring up any of them said baptized in order to obtain? Now, actually, one of them he brought up here, Bill's out of date. Bill, the NIV's out of date that you brought up here. They've changed that one. <laughs> he, he, put, he put one up here that they've since corrected. Now, you bring the right one back up here, Bill, and put it up here, and we'll comment on that NIV if you want me to. But he put up an NIV that's been revised and changed because evidently they had it wrong, and they put it back to the word for. What was it they had it on his chart, Gary? So that your sins may be forgiven. Yeah, so that your sins. They changed it back to for. That's what I wish he'd do to all these passages that he perverts and puts in interpretations on. Instead of getting up here and saying, in order to obtain, come back to for, Bill. Come back to ice. Come back to unto. Come back to into. Now, let me say again, concerning all the passages on baptism, from Matthew chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, all the passages he can bring up here on baptism, I believe every single one of them, I believe baptism does exactly what baptism is capable of doing in every single situation. In 1 Peter 3, I believe baptism can save in the only sense in which baptism can save. And if he can tell me the sense, I agree with it. I agree with it. Baptism will wash away your sins in Acts 22, 16 in whatever sense baptism is capable of washing away your sins. Now, he brought up Matthew 26 and the blood of Christ. Now, Bill, come on. Be honest. Face it. You know good and well that Christ's blood washes away sins in a different sense and manner than water baptism. If you don't believe that, well, let's just quit because I, I don't even want to talk with a man that doesn't believe in the blood of Christ, the efficiency of the blood of Christ. I believe you believe in the efficiency of the blood of Christ is superior to water baptism in its efficiency. Now, you know good and well that the blood of Christ in washing away sins or remitting sins is doing it in a sense that must be, by the very nature of the case, different than the sense of baptism. Jesus hung on a cross and suffered death. I went down into the water. You, ladies and gentlemen, in your obedience to Christ, in your honest and sincere effort to obey Christ, you went down into the water, but you did not suffer what the Lord suffered. You imitated Him. You followed Him. You obeyed Him. You were in the likeness of His death, burial, and resurrection, but you didn't do the suffering, ladies and gentlemen. That was the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood represents His life. He laid it down for you. Please, I beg of you, 
do not disgrace the blood of Jesus Christ by making it equal only to water in its ability to wash away your sins. It's superior. We can stand up here and we can argue and we can batter back and forth. I love Brother Jackson. I believe with my heart, I hope and I pray he is a Christian brother. I, I know I differ with him. I know I call him a cult and all this. But I love him. I believe Jesus died for him. And the blood of Jesus Christ is more precious than water baptism. And I love water baptism. Please do not degrade the blood of the Son of God. I apologize for the emotion. This is quite out of character. And I'm surely not doing it for any performance. It just grabbed me all at once. This has been an emotional time in my life anyway. The war that's going on is on my mind greater than this debate. I'm concerned for the boys. I'm concerned for our country. More than that, I'm concerned for the world. We have something going on over there that's a mystery to the greatest minds in this country, ladies and gentlemen, the military men. And I don't know, I don't know what your views of prophecy are, and I'm not going to get off on that. But I tell you, it strikes me as being satanic. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right, let me get back to the things at hand here. Let me try to deal with Bill's charts. I apologize for missing your first questions, Bill. Number one, he had a while ago, uh, baptism is a work. Yes, it's a work. Faith is a work. Anything commanded of God is a work, a work of righteousness. Faith worketh by love. Number eight, in the record of the jailer's conversion, after he was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. When does the context show this Holy Spirit called him a believer? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible teaches he that believeth on the Son is not condemned. I'll take that of plight to the jailer and everyone else. What about Mr. Spurgeon on baptismal regeneration? Well, now he's the one that's got to answer on that question, baptismal regeneration, because Alexander Campbell is the one who said in his writings that baptism was another term for regeneration. We never have taught that, so that's his problem to deal with. Number 10, are you in agreement with Beasley Murray? I agree with Beasley Murray in his book where he said that men who believe that baptism was absolutely necessary for salvation go too far. Beasley Murray said, those that teach the absolute necessity of baptism, they go too far, Bill. Go too far. He said the Holy Spirit has to be involved in the regeneration work, and you don't believe that except in your method of interpreting it. Now, uh, since you've produced a tract claiming the baptizer stood as a mediator between God and man, well, all I, uh, whatever track he's talking about here, uh, it's no relation to the proposition because I'm not in the affirmative. You're the one that's doing the affirmative about the baptizer, so you're the one to deal with that. Please tell us exactly how Acts 2.38 should be read to fully, completely convey the truth relating to baptism. Well, I take it just like it is. Acts 2.38, baptized for the remission of sins. Now, in whatever sense baptism can remit sins, I accept it. If baptism can literally remit sin, figuratively remit, remit sin, pictorially remit sin, whatever, as long as you don't put it on the same level as the blood of Jesus Christ, I'll accept it. Now, I think that covers those questions. What about his charts here? Okay, all the charts on water baptism, I believe them just like they are. Now, this chart he has here on Naaman in the garden and today, uh, none of those relate to his proposition that I can see Naaman in the Old Testament in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Today, salvation not in the water but in obedience. Well, I I'd accept that. I believe that. So I don't have any problem with that one. Now, his uh, Acts 2.38 translations, let him bring the one up here that says in order to obtain... For in order to obtain, he didn't, he didn't do it. And I don't contend for because of, as he tried to put off on me. Ice remission of sins, ice used, and he goes through all these many ways here, and he never does come up with in order to obtain. Not <laughs> nowhere on the chart. That's what he teaches, in order to obtain. Can my opponent find refuge in the Greek? Was Christ's blood shed because of? I never did affirm that, so I don't guess I have to defend it. For the remission of sins is what I take. 
Regeneration and baptism. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, but by His mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Well, is He affirming there that baptism regenerates? Is He affirming that? Let Him get up here and expel it out for us. Faith regeneration, repentance regeneration, confession regeneration. Which one are you contending for, Bill? You're asking me questions. You're supposed to be in the affirmative. You're supposed to give the definitions, and then I'll refute the definitions. Now, in his proposition J14, you don't have to put it up, the affirmative's obligation to show that baptism is for the obtaining of forgiveness of sins. Now, where has he showed any translation, any passage, anything that says baptism is for the obtaining of the remission of sins? He hasn't done that. That's his interpretation. Put my chart back up. I left off a while ago. Number two, what I'm not denying what I'm not denying. Hold my time, if you will, all right? Now, I left off about right here. The truth is, he interprets Acts 2.38 just as it was interpreted by Alexander Campbell. That's exactly what he's doing. Straight out of the McCullough debate in 1823, where Alexander Campbell said, I was the first man to teach baptism in order to the remission of sins. And this man is walking in his tracks. He graduated from David Lipscomb College. David Lipscomb was the protege of Tolbert Fanning. Tolbert Fanning was the personal friend of Alexander Campbell. And this man goes right back to Campbell through those men. Jackson to Lipscomb College to Tolbert Fanning to Alexander Campbell. Trace him right back Trail of Blood, Link Chain Succession, Bill Jackson to Alexander Campbell in order to obtain right out of the McCullough debate in 1823 and then finally in 1827, four years later, a man named Walter Scott went out. Don't shake your head, brother. Bill's got the book over here, Memoirs of Campbell. Get it and read it. Walter Scott went out, baptized William a man, he said this was the first man since primitive times to be baptized according to the ancient gospel, 1827. What's this man said about Alexander Campbell in his magazines, in his papers, in the spiritual swords? I've got charts here I could put up here quoting from 15 or 20 of these men talking about giants of the restoration movement and the first one out of the cookie jar is Alexander Campbell or Thomas Campbell, or Walter Scott, or Barton Stone. And I will let the man baptize me, and I'll repent, and everything else he wants me to do, if he'll show me one passage where Alexander Campbell was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins, or that Thomas Campbell was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins, or that Barton W. Stone was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins, or that Walter Scott was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. Or that David Lipscomb, the founder of the man's school, where he went to college, was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. He's a McGarryite and he knows it. He's fallen Austin McGarry who said that you had to understand why you were going down into baptism and that understanding was that you know that you're going down there in order to obtain the remission of sins. If you don't do that, your baptism's no good. And that's the doctrine he's following. The firm foundation, Austin McGarry, baptism with the right understanding doctrine, the spiritual sword cult up here at Memphis, Tennessee, headed by the inimitable Thomas B. Warren, the brother logician of the brotherhood, the man who dreams in syllogisms. Oh, that's what they said in the spiritual sword. I don't know. I saw the man up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and he looked like to me he's dreaming about something. He's floating on air. Something, I don't know. But anyway, these men follow that spiritual sword. They call it an encyclopedia of Bible doctrine. And you go contrary to it, my brother, and you might as well take a knife and cut your throat. They'll write you up and split you up in quarters and put you out for the birds. 
Yes, sir. I'm not denying that people may accept and follow the Bible in any given time and place. And what I'm asking him is, or what I'm denying is, I deny that Alexander Campbell and his followers did anything which restored anything. His restoration movement did not restore a single thing, and I challenge him to name one thing the restoration movement restored. Baptism, church, ancient order of things, as they call it, ancient gospel, ancient anything. The Campbells and them never restored a thing. They just started a new movement. It split up into pieces over missionary societies, musical instruments, anti-orphan homes, orphan homes, and all kinds of other things, cups, classes. It split up in who knows how many ways. Now he's going to get up here and justify that by saying, oh, you got two dozen different kind of Baptists. Well, Bill, what do you expect out of us? We're just sectarians. That's all we are. What do you expect out of sectarians? denominationalists. You people are the one universal church of Christ. Speak where the Bible speaks. Whether it's Tant, Harper, or you, or King, or whichever one in whichever cult it is. Thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. That was tonight's debate footage. You had romping and stomping Bill Jackson. <laughs> Uh, jumping all over your case there, Bob. He was talking about uh, every kind of little thing from, uh, as my notes say, about your uh, Spurgeon on baptismal regeneration, and uh, he didn't seem to like your uh, history and the oracles of God and the washing away of sins and patterns and cases and instances and everything else. Do you have anything you'd like to... Well, on that word instances, uh, he was the first one, I think, to introduce that word instances as well as the word cases, but somehow or another in the debate, uh, I got blamed for the word instances, but he introduced that. But I, one of the significant things, I believe it was, it was in this particular evening's discussion, at least the second night, it's in my notes here, he had a Acts 238 chart showing uh, numerous translations and he mentioned 200 scholars and 30 or more translations and uh, he was in the affirmative and if he was going to use those translations he should have been showing that they mean what he had asserted that for or ice in the Greek meant and he said that it meant in order to obtain but you notice there wasn't a single one of those quotations that translated it in order to obtain. So what did he do to divert attention? He started jumping off on the because of idea mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. said they don't say this. And that was a red herring because he should have been using those translations to back up his affirmative mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. going off and chasing some rabbit down a trail as if it was any consequence. Well, as I've found uh, watching the debate, he, he chased quite a few rabbits, in my opinion, and fished quite a few red herrings, right. and uh, he loved to attack straw men. In as, his, as in his emphasis, he was talking about the salvation was in the obedience. Mm -hmm. Well, as I've pointed out, and as I did point out in the debate, faith is obedience. Faith is obedience. Faith is obedience. <laughs> well, we're going to have to leave now. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you for joining us. To, uh, Tune in to the uh, credits at the end of the show, and you can write or call for the information we've talked about. Thank you for joining us, and God bless you. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512 218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.